find another way to, just not today. It has to be today. We're not done. If not, you're sick of failing. No, that's the whole point. We must never stop failing because the minute we do, we failed. Which is exactly why I can't quit. So if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go sit on this rock and make a plan. Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves is a big budget adaptation of the Patient Man's board game, which follows Edgin, an average thief living in a fantasy world that's much like other fantasy worlds you've seen, except more comedic. When Edgin's daughter gets stolen from him by this douchebag lord and a witch, he must assemble a ragtag group of different fantasy class people to steal back the daughter as well as a wealth of gold. And as a whole, this is a movie destined for success, simply because it's pretty damn good. It's got a great cast, it's very tongue-in-cheek and entertaining. I mean, it's just a really fun good time where the positives far outweigh the negatives. Yet, success was not what it got. It made $200 million at the box office, which sounds good, until you see that it cost $150 million to make and thus lost a small fortune, ensuring that we probably won't see similar movies in the near future again. And as always, there are superficial explanations for D&D's flop, mainly the release date, which put it against two juggernauts stealing its audience. That's definitely true, but it's a pretty easy answer which doesn't help you and me because most writers and filmmakers don't decide the release date. Not to mention that it also doesn't answer the most important question, which is why. Why are you running? Why are you running? Why did Mario and John Wick 4 pull in audiences while D&D didn't, even though you could argue that it's better than at least one of them? Well, the answer to that, my friend, lies in the current landscape of cinema and in what has happened to it. Yeah, the fact is that most people have so much entertainment now that they go to the theater only when absolutely necessary. When a movie is such a massive event that you must see it to be part of the current pop culture discussion at schools and workplaces and on the internet. Both Mario and John Wick 4 in their own ways are that, whereas D&D sadly isn't. And the key factor deciding whether a movie feels like a must-see massive event comes down to just a few letters of greatness. C. C. P. Uh, no, not that. I meant C. The good kind of C. C. P. Uh, no, not that either. Too, too many C's. Take off the C. Just C. P. Oh, uh, no. No, no, no. C, C, P, character, concept, plot. These three areas are what turn a movie into a must-see event, as they did with Mario and John Wick 4. And while they do work in this movie just fine, they're ultimately not enough. So today, let's look at D&D through these key areas to see why they weren't enough to make it a modern event movie feeling massive enough to be a must-see, as well as how you have to treat them to ensure that your movie is one. The character insufficiency here is that the main heroes either aren't too special or their specialty is limited to doing nothing more than what is expected of them. If you look at the main protagonist Edgin, for example, he's totally fine. He's funny and entertaining and someone you enjoy spending time with. But the issue is that he doesn't really do much. He's more like the idea guy. He tells others to do something and then tags along. Like in the actual events, he's very dependent on others. He gets saved from human threats by his friend. He gets saved from beastly threats by his rival. He gets saved from a lot of different things and doesn't really achieve much in terms of overcoming obstacles. What is it exactly that you bring to this? Me. I'm a, I'm a planner. You've already made the plan, so what value do you have now? If uh, the plan fails, the existing plan, I make a new plan. So you make plans that fail. He also plays the loot. And to be fair, that was the direction the directors went for. They wanted to make Edgin's companion the physical badass. They wanted to quote-unquote emasculate him, whatever exactly they mean by that. I know this is now heading into a very specific modern movie topic, but I'll leave that for others to touch on. You must not be an and join the conservatives. Also, stop being so woke. The 
reason I'd say reducing Edgin into this average role is not a good idea is because it makes him unspecial. Like sure, he comes up with these okay ideas, but that alone isn't really cinematically extraordinary or massive. And when modern audiences go to the big screen, they expect to see massive larger than life characters able to fill that screen. You know, a plumber entering a new world and having to rise to the challenge of taking on the biggest power of that world. An assassin having to climb an infinite metaphorical and physical staircase to take on the highest order of the assassin world. Those are characters you can take with you from the theater and whose actions you can discuss the next day, right? Whereas a guy who makes plans that you and I could make and then just kind of tags along, what is there to take with you or discuss? And to be clear, I'm not necessarily talking about power levels here so much as I'm talking about the relativity between power levels and actions. Because, you know, there are very powerful characters here, from barbarians to wizards to shapeshifters. It's just that the special things that they do aren't so special to them. Oh, a barbarian takes on a group of soldiers in a physical fight, and then later on takes on another group of soldiers in a physical fight. Well, that's about as much as you'd expect from a barbarian, right? Oh, a wizard conjures this magic hand to fight the evil witch's magic hand, okay? Oh, a shapeshifter turns into a big beast and beats up someone tiny compared to her, okay? Now, I don't want to discount what these characters do because I do like them. The shapeshifter especially, I think she's awesome. She has this very cool transformation sequence, for example, where she spies on the witch and then flees while constantly having to shift into a new animal form to get out of danger. It's awesome. But still, at the end of the day, none of these characters are pushed enough to really impress you in terms of what they do and achieve. They kinda operate right on the line you expect them to operate on. Yeah, this guy takes on a dragon, but for him, it sort of seems to be just another day at the office. Whereas, look at Forrest Gump. He's a guy expected to have a lesser life than others who ends up having a life amounting to much more than others. Look at Arthur Fleck. He's a nobody in his world who ends up going insane and taking the world right with him. These are characters who, from their perspective, take you on an incredible journey of events and achievements. A journey you can and wanna discuss with your friend at work the next day. A journey you gotta go see. Now, every movie is different and characters can always be anything. But when you're making a character for the big screen that you want audiences to drive down to see, the safest bet is to make that character big enough to fill that screen, to astound the audience with their journey. And the easiest way to do that is to first find your character's uniqueness and then within the confines of that uniqueness, force them to rise well beyond the standard level. For example, if you have a movie about a rich, highly educated kid representing her school in a spelling bee contest, paper. that's not really a big movie character. But if the kid is a poor dyslexic immigrant from another country who must succeed in a spelling bee contest despite his struggles with the local language, now you're onto something. The movie would be about this specific character pushing himself to greatness in the context of his own existence. You know, every day while taking care of his sick mother, he uses an old old broken phone to do these 10 minute interactive lessons to learn the local language, expanding into all kinds of different lessons, until in three weeks he has his first spelling bee round. And he's amazing, he becomes the best hope for his poor school to win the championship in a way that would also save his family. That's a big movie character. And yeah, if you wanna be like that kid and learn a language, the best way to do it is with Babbel. It's this super easy to use language app that fits your daily life and teaches you through a variety of efficient and non-boring hands-on methods which are designed by real language teachers to get you talking in three weeks. Tal como lo he hecho con mi canal en español. Muy bien. They're sponsoring a 60% film mentor discount with the link below, so if you wanna easily try learning a new language, do check it out. The concept insufficiency here is that mostly what this movie offers isn't anything new that would compel audiences to drive to the theater. 
Once again, there is a lot of entertaining stuff present. We have cool magic abilities, we have cool supernatural locations, we have medieval battles and dragons, shape-shifting characters, badass wizards and the undead, deadly games in a transforming maze, big trailer-fitting CGI. I mean, everything modern audiences require from blockbusters is here. The issue is that, aside from maybe some smaller visual differences, modern audiences have already seen all this. A sequence in a transforming maze with that deadly monster. Didn't we already see that in Harry Potter, in freaking Wrath of the Titans? A big medieval fight sequence with dragons and whatever. Aren't we already used to seeing that stuff at home? A finale where the sky opens up to reveal this world-ending CGI thing. Isn't that like every blockbuster from the mid-2010s? Mostly, the novelty factor here is reliant on the fact that familiar elements have become comedic. Yeah, it's a dragon like the one in that Lord of the Rings movie, yep. but this time the dragon is fat, so it's funny, it's different, right? What's the sound in you dead? Did he eat the last one? Yeah, the medieval war looks like a discon version of Game of Thrones, yep. but this time it's told as this quirky backstory, so it's funny, different, right? That's the last thing I remember. Hell yeah. Yeah, there are these small people who are like hobbits, yep. but this time it's Bradley Cooper. It's funny and different, right? And Hulk. <sighs> Smash. And while I do agree that a lot of these elements and sequences are tonally different and entertaining, it's not quite enough. It's just tough to imagine someone coming up to you at work and saying, Oh my god, this movie has a fat dragon, you have to go see it. Oh my god, Bradley Cooper is small in this one scene. You absolutely gotta drive to the theater today instead of waiting for the digital release. Because for context, these are discussions surrounding John Wick 4, for example. There are multiple incredible conceptual elements positioned in a way you've never seen, from John Wick gunfighting among speeding cars, to him falling down an infinite staircase, to him having that top view shootout with that dragon's breath shotgun. These are sequences that will drop your jaw as well as make you think about them later on and urge your friends to go see them on the biggest screen possible. Huh? Huh? You gotta admit, this is cool! Even Mario does this with the help of the IP, with the Mario World and the Smash Bros sequence with the power-ups and with the Rainbow Road in the Sky sequence and whatnot. And not to be unfair, this movie does have some of that. There's the cool CGI sequence of a shapeshifter turning into animals to escape the witch, not to mention the best part of the movie, the high sequence. Basically, the heroes have this portal gun and they have to find a way to get a portal in this treasure wagon which will take it to the villain's vault and allow them to break in. And it's a very awesome multi-step sequence. They have to put the portal in a painting and attach the painting to the bottom of the wagon. They have to break into the wagon through the portal and then get the painting inside. And then they have to make it seem like nothing ever happened and wait for it to be delivered to the vault. All of which makes me say just one thing. My compliments to the cook! Not only is this sequence awesome, it's also one that I've never seen on the big screen before. A boots on the ground heist pulled on a moving wagon by playing with the physics of a portal gun. That's a fresh conceptual cinematic element and sequence I would definitely discuss with a friend afterwards. Great. Unfortunately, as I said, the game has changed. Most people have such a wealth of entertainment at home now that they're not gonna bother driving to the theater for one two-minute thing. To pull them in, you need to have like three, four, five big kick-ass elements and sequences they haven't seen. That's why Avatar made two billion dollars. That's what Tom Cruise lives for, to offer audiences something they've never experienced. I know it's tough to come up with new ideas anymore, but there's no way around it. When you're writing your movie, ask yourself, is this a fresh conceptual element and or sequence that I would tell my friends about? And until you have a positive answer for at least a few different things worth well over 10 minutes of screen time, you have to keep working.
The plot insufficiency here is that the movie itself doesn't feel big or urgent enough to be a must-see for many different reasons. The first thought of this is that a lot of what happens is pretty easy. Fighting capture in the beginning is mostly a joke. Okay, chop it off. Before we leave the city. Get boiled linseed oil. I know. The shapeshifter's introduction is mostly a casual confrontation. That's a... What is that again? Owlbear. All the wizard has to do to unlock the powers of this magical helmet is punch a guy in the face once. You had your time. Now it's my turn. <clears throat> that was easy. Overall, a lot of obstacles here feel like minor inconveniences to the point where they depend fully on the character's own ignorant stupidity. Only answer when I talk to you, okay? Yes. Why did you say okay at the end of that? I didn't. Fantastic. It is consistent with the tone here, yes, but it also makes the film feel like a laid back walk in the park. And the audiences can lay back at home just fine. They don't feel a big need to go to the theater to see brain monsters that do nothing or traps of the underworld that are worth nothing. Another side of this is that there are no proper consequences. The wizard does accidentally activate the underworld trap to destroy their path, but whatever, it turns out they just happen to have this portal gun, so it doesn't matter. The heroes do accidentally use up all their questions with the dead guy they need information from, but whatever, there's a whole battlefield of them, so it doesn't matter. The shapeshifter does get found out spying on the evil witch, but whatever, in the moment she gets away scot-free, nothing happened. So she did become a deer. Overall, there's not a whole lot of tangible negativity which takes away from the positivity, and audiences can feel those same vanilla feelings at home just fine. Another side is that the resolutions to the journey are quite weak. All the heroes have to do to ultimately defeat the douchebag lord and save the daughter is throw a potato at his face, okay? All the heroes have to do to stop this world-ending threat is make civilians run away from it because apparently they're too dumb to do it themselves and then fight this CGI statue and fight this big hand conjured by the witch and... I counted your time stop. I got better. We had to distract you so Kira could slap on that cuff and... Yeah, the wizard says out loud that he negated the witch's time freeze somehow and in that moment the daughter put a magic resistant bracelet on the witch with the help of her invisibility necklace that only she has in the movie somehow and <laughs> that's it, the witch is defeated, okay? It is fine, sure, but it doesn't really make the audience shout, oh my god, did you see that? Did you see them do that? No, the villain is just kind of defeated and then so much for that. The thrill of the climax feels so meh that you can stay at home without it just fine. And most importantly, the stakes as a whole just don't feel big enough. The internal half of the stakes comes down to the villain stealing Edgin's daughter and Edgin having to get her back. That's fine, but the issue is that the context around it is pretty lacking. Why is it so important for the villain to keep the daughter? Why not just let her go? I don't know, they don't really even share more than one scene together. It's kind of another superficial joke. I, I never actually saw the appeal of being a father till I became one. To have another person look up to you and allow you to, to shape them in your Shush, own. my darling. Quiet. You're not taking my money. And also, why would it be tough for Edgin to convince his daughter that he didn't actually leave her for riches or anything? It shouldn't be that big a deal to make her see the truth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. As in, the internal stakes are there, but they're just not strong enough. I'm quite sure that the villain's grip on the daughter isn't tight enough to break, and that the daughter's hatred of Edkin isn't strong enough to amend. Especially when compared to something like The Mask of Zaro, where the villain steals the daughter as his final connection to the woman he loved, and where the daughter doesn't even know that Zaro is her father. You look so much like your mother. How would you know that? That feels real and big. And then there's the external side of the stakes, which comes down to the witch using this sky beam to turn people into zombies for some reason. What's gonna happen when people are zombies? Why is it so terrible since it apparently has already once happened and yet the world within this movie hasn't been in any way affected? And why would I care anyway since I don't really know or care about any of the people of this world? I don't know, the external half is just kinda there. We began destroying our homes. If we don't stop Forge soon, there'll be nothing left to defend. I'm here to tell you right now. 
We don't care. Let me tell you. Right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. And although it's totally fitting and it does the job, for most audiences, it's not enough. Most audiences don't bother showing up until it feels like the Stanley Cup Finals where everything that's currently playable is in play. When the high table is getting involved to put an end to John Wick and this path he's been on. When Mario has to not only save his brother, but also the Mario Kingdom as well as his home. As a whole, what I'm getting at is that a more casual, not a big deal plot oriented movie like Dungeons and Dragons can function just fine, but in modern theaters it may feel small and struggle because of it. That, my friends, is the power of the big P in the big feeling CCP. Thank <laughs> you.